propose getting rid of the corporate tax. If you do that, how would you fill that revenue gap? Well, I think every serious economic study, including a CBO study, has shown that when you cut the, uh, the corporate income tax rate, uh, for every 10% cut, you get a 1% growth in the economy. So what we've got to do is get our economy growing again. You can't get the economy growing when you're laying off people every single day, practically every single day in Southwest Virginia. And that's rippling all across the Commonwealth along the rail lines where you don't need as many people to transport the coal because not as much is going to the port. Uh, in the port because you don't have as much coal being shipped out across the world. Uh, it's, be, it's resulting in increased fuel bills for people. So we, we've got to get the economy growing. And the way to get the economy growing is unleash the energy productivity of Virginia. Look, I think we all want clean energy. We all want clean air. We all want clean water. I don't know where this myth got started that some people don't care about it. We ought to all care about it. But I think we've got to measure that against the, the suffering we create in the lives of people as we try to move more and more toward an environment that we know will preserve the very best that we have. So we, we have got to get regulations off the backs of small businesses, off the backs of Virginians, so that they can grow their businesses. You don't realize 70% of the people employed in Virginia are employed in small businesses. 70% of them. And yet those small businesses are the ones that are least capable of dealing with the regulatory burden that is often placed on them, not only by the federal government, but by the state government as well. And if we give them some breathing room, they will do what Americans always do. They will unleash their own productive and creative capacities. They will expand their businesses. They will do the things that Americans do best. That's how the greatest nation on earth has been grown. It hasn't been grown by a big government. It's been grown by a lot of individuals and families working together to build a vision for themselves and a big vision for their future that not only benefits them, but benefits the entire community as well. That's why we are the envy of the world. That's why people are still rushing to get here. They're not coming here because they think this is the country where there is so much security. They're coming here to believe in the belief that this is a country with opportunity, where they can become something. They come and they start businesses. They come and they try to create wealth for themselves, often leaving poverty to get here. Many of our ancestors did the same thing. So we have got to unleash the productive and creative capacities of the people of Virginia. Remember. Virginia is where the foundations of this nation were laid, and I believe Virginia is where they can be restored. Well, thank you. And one of the things that I have been responsible for and, and worked hard and that we are constitutionally mandated to do each year in the Commonwealth of Virginia is balance our budget. Um, you know, let's, let's be frank. We have been through one of the worst recessions uh, in the past five to six years that most of us have experienced uh, in our lives. We, uh, as an example, have cut six billion dollars uh, out of an eighty billion dollar budget in the Commonwealth of Virginia without raising any new revenue except for this past year when we put the transportation package on the, on the table. Now what has that done to the Commonwealth? Let's talk about what happens when you cut that type of funding. It affects K through 12 education, it affects the ed education of our, our children. Uh, it affects our health care system, Medicaid in, in Virginia. It takes away services from those folks. Uh, and it also affects our first responders. So what we need to do and what I will do as the lieutenant governor is be fiscally responsible. And I think it's a, it's a very pertinent question. One of the two of us sit, sitting and standing here tonight is going to oversee an $80 billion budget in the Commonwealth of Virginia. I have the experience. I have started a business back in the mid-90s. Uh, I started with 40 doctors. We now have over 100 pediatric subspecialists. We employ uh, over 250 people. I know what it's all about to have fiscal responsibility uh, running a business. I know what it's all about to budget our, or excuse me, to balance our budget. This plan that you just heard to do away with our corporate income tax would slice, take away, however you want to describe it, a billion dollars with a B out of our budget each year. It would literally 
and have an experience in this, it would literally bankrupt the Commonwealth of Virginia. We don't need to go there. and we will move that forward as Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. I'm Mr. North on health care and aging. You know, Virginia's not poor. It ranks seventh in the nation for income and is home to America's three most affluent counties, Loudoun, Fairfax, and Arlington. At the same time, the state limits its Medicaid program to the federal minimum requirement for eligibility, which ranks it close to the bottom, 48th in Medicaid assistance. With our aging population, health care costs expected to rise. If Virginia has not yet decided whether to expand Medicaid eligibility under the Affordable Care Act. Should Virginia move forward with expansions, why or why not? Well, a simple question, uh, excuse me, the answer to, to your question, Peggy, is yes, ma'am, uh, we should. And I will... Uh, <laughs> I've been practicing pediatric neurology uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia for the last... Uh, 20 plus years, there is nothing more distressing than when a child and their family don't have access to health care. Let me talk to you very briefly about the three pillars of health care. They are quality, and we have excellent quality in the Commonwealth of Virginia. The second is access. We can always improve on our access. But the third area is cost, and it is the cost that are driving this Commonwealth and this nation to its needs. And so in order to address costs, one has to have coverage. Let me give you an example. When the Jones family has a child that has an asthmatic attack and they don't have coverage, they don't have a primary care provider, where do they go to receive their care? They go to the emergency room. And there is a time and a place for the emergency room. But that's not where preventive health takes place. That's not where education takes place. And if you want to talk about ringing the cash register, that's what will do it. So, you know, the Affordable Care Act, whether you like it or not, and there's some great things about the Affordable Care Act. Um, Pam and I, we have two children, uh, 25 and 22. They're able to stay on our insurance policy. They're able to get a start in life, get off to their work, etc. But what the, what the Medicaid expansion will do is that they will, it will open up coverage to approximately 400,000 hard-working Virginians. I, and I would underline the word hard-working. This is not a handout. These are Virginians who are working whose salaries have not been able to keep up with the cost of health care. And again, when they don't have coverage, they go to the emergency room. It is literally billions of dollars that if we don't use it in Virginia, it's federal money, 100% for the first three years. If we don't use it, surrounding states such as Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, and Florida. And one other thing that I would say about the Medicaid expansion, and, and this comes from the heart, and that is that about 30,000 of those 400,000 hardworking Virginians that I referred to are veterans who are returning from Afghanistan and Iraq. The least that we can do, my fellow Virginians, for those that have gone abroad and fought for our freedom is to make sure that they have health care coverage and that their families are taken care of when they come home. <laughs> Medicine is evolving from a quantity-based system. In other words, I'm incentivized by how many patients I see a day to more of an outcome or quality-based. That's another way that we will address the cost that I referred to earlier. As a pediatric neurologist, as a health care provider, I want to be at the table as we move forward with that evolution. Thank you so much. Well, it's a very serious issue. And again, let's understand it in human terms. My father was a Medicaid recipient, spent his last 10 years in a nursing home. Uh, the last thing in the world we want to do is deny those Americans who work hard, have contributed to our culture, to our country, the health care that they need. The question is, how do we do it? Look, I've spent over 30 years in ministry. You're always trying to figure out ways not to hurt people, but to help people. Uh, here's my concern that, uh, with this approach and why, yes, I oppose the Medicaid expansion because I simply don't think that's the way to cover our poor citizens. Uh, I believe that 
This promise of the federal government that it's going to cover 100% of the additional Medicaid uh, bills for, uh, from, from now until 2016, and then 90% after that, uh, and then I guess go back to the standard 50%, is what happens is the federal government is borrowing money, taking money from Virginia, borrowing all the money, and then giving that money back to us. Now, we're already in a fiscal crisis, and we're talking about sequestration, we're talking about the possibility of a government shutdown, uh, and we don't know what that would mean if that would happen. And yet we're putting all of our hope in the federal government taking care of vast bills that the Commonwealth of Virginia is in no position to take care of. I think there are other ways to do this. <laughs> Uh, and I think we need a variety of approaches to this, rather than a one-size, government-fits-all approach. All, we've got free clinics all over the Commonwealth of Virginia that are doing a marvelous job with volunteer doctors and nurses and pharmaceuticals being uh, offered to people for free. Uh, we can provide people with catastrophic care for those situations where they need an operation or they have some sort of major illness. There are ways to approach this. Look, if you have compassion for people, you want to see to it that they have health care, but turning it over to the federal government is a way to arrive at the opposite result. issue of a glaring failure to address and treat people with mental health illnesses comes to light after every mass shooting we see, just as it did again last week. How can Virginia better treat the mentally ill? Well, first thing we've got to do is have a different philosophy and approach to this. Um, if you're talking specifically, for example, about mentally ill people who actually go out and hurt others, obviously we need to take a hard look at HIPAA and the fact that even when those people show suicidal or homicidal ideation. Uh, we can't do anything about it. It can't be reported. It can't be revealed. And as a result, many people lose their lives. We clearly have to do something about that. Uh, I think we have got to go back to a system where people who clearly are incapable of living in our culture safely and without harming others uh, have some sort of opportunity to be housed. You know, after the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, there was sort of a revolution in America in which people said, you know, uh, mentally ill people are, are really not mentally ill, it's just we don't understand them. And we don't need to have them in institutions, we don't need to have them in places where we're keeping them and taking care of them. What we're finding out for some, we absolutely do. And I think we have got to do that in order to take care of the mentally ill people that we have in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Here again. I think we've got to begin to look at ways to bring all of our resources to bear, not just the resources of government, because I think that's all too often where we look. Uh, look, I don't, I don't want to scare you, but I've got some mentally ill people in my family, um, and, 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 they, and they need help. They need treatment. And I, I, I've treated people over the years as a minister and tried to help people who suffer from mental illness. You can't just cast them aside, and you can't pretend that they don't need something more than an occasional visit to a hospital or a doctor. They do need something more. They need to be housed, they need to be taken care of, because very often, as you all know, the worst of our mentally ill will not take their medication, even when you prescribe it, even when you give it to them. Many of the veterans that are on the streets right now are on the streets because they are mentally ill and they're not getting the treatment that they need. So we've got to rethink how we deal with our mentally ill. Uh, and I think that Virginia is on the brink of doing that. I think we're getting some leadership from Ken Cuccinelli on that issue. Uh, that's, a, that's an issue of great passion for him. Uh, and I think that we all need to be aware of the fact that doing what we've been doing is simply not working. It's bad for, for the mentally ill people who need our help, uh, and it's bad for the citizens that sometimes those who are suicidal or homicidal end up hurting. So we've got to protect them, and we've got to protect our citizenry. Our citizenry deserves better than what we're giving them right now. Uh, and I guarantee you, uh, with me and Ken Cuccinelli over the next four years, because we both have compassion for them and a concern for our fellow citizens, we're going to do something about the problem of mental illness and how we treat it. <laughs> I just want to be sure I understand. You, you, you're saying that we should go back to institutionalizing. I think else. in some cases, there. I don't think there's any choice in some cases. I mean, because there is no other way to prevent some of the violence that is taking place. I'm not saying that that's just a sort of blanket approach, 
But I think compassion would suggest we don't want them hurting themselves or hurting others. Um, and we've got to do something more than just sort of observe it and not do anything until some tragedy happens. I think the last three or four, uh, well, the last, at least the last two or three uh, major mass murders and killings have been by people who, who are mentally ill, who perhaps could have been treated somewhere, kept somewhere where they couldn't have hurt themselves or hurt others. That's a pretty costly uh, proposal to institutionalize. Well, here again, I think we've got to stop just looking to government to do it, and we've got to figure out other ways to get the community involved in this process. Uh, look, folks, volunteerism and nonprofit organizations and people working together is how this country was built. We, we haven't built it on the basis of, of government trying to do everything and be everything to everybody. Thank you, Peggy, and how sad, and I, I'm sorry that you have people in your family that are mentally ill, but how sad to think that you would go visit them in an institution, Mr. Jackson. We can do better than that here in the Commonwealth. We open up in our health care, which we are seriously lacking on, so the answer is not to put them in an institution. And again, if you want to talk about ringing the cash register, that's the way to do it, my friend. Now, let's, uh, let's talk very briefly. I think one of the, the, the questions that, that you asked, and, and, and I think we need to comment on this tonight, is, is gun violence in, in this commonwealth. And, 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 and I want to say that I have an interesting perspective. I grew up on the eastern shore of Virginia. I hunted, I fished, I still own guns. I have also <coughs> served in the United States Army, and I unfortunately know what these uh, military-style assault weapons do to the human body. Furthermore, I have unfortunately been at the bedside in the hospital attending to a child who is the victim of gun violence. Now, the other thing that I am uh, fortunate to have done, during, certainly during this campaign, I have gotten to know the families of Virginia Tech victims. And you know what? Uh, if you sit down with folks like that, you will quickly realize we do not need any more Virginia Techs. We do not need any more Sandy Hooks. We do not need any more what just happened across the Potomac River in Washington. So how are we going to fix that as a society? The first step is to sit down at the table and have a discussion and say, let's agree that we have a problem with gun violence in our society. And if we can agree to that, then we can move forward. If we can't, then again, I would have those people go sit down with a family from Virginia Tech and just hear that story. But once we agree that we have a problem, then we can move forward as a society. And there are certainly some areas to include, uh, open up access to better mental health and also making sure that we talk about background checks. At the end of the day, we're not going to do anything to threaten the Second Amendment, but we need to make sure that the guns are not in the hands of criminals and those that are mentally ill. Thank you.